So I'm Honza, and I will talk about uh, speech data mining and why it's not yet time uh, to enjoy the benefits and go to Cayman Islands or something like that. And uh, of course I sourced lots of material from my colleagues, so you will see lots of figures, tables from Franta Kresel, Marta Scarafiat, Karel Veseli, Kartik Baskar and Mirko Hanemann. Actually these guys did all the work, I'm just speaking about it. So, this is the agenda. Uh, a couple of slides on uh, what we are doing, who we are, where we are. And then I go into the technology, so basic components uh, of automatic uh, speech recognition system. I will actually uh, walk you a little bit through the history. So, uh, I will show you how such a system uh, looked uh, like 15 years back. And then came the neural nets that basically turned the whole area uh, upside down, as many others. So I will start with feature extraction, then go to acoustic modeling, and then also present you some hot topics that we are working on now, and maybe even other one, other ones uh, at the end. So let's start uh, with the introduction. At the beginning is audio, and uh, we say we are doing speech data mining. So basically, we can uh, either uh, say who uh, spoke, whether it was a given person. If we have no idea about the person, we can at least try to estimate whether it was male or female, or do some basic uh, classification. Uh, we can perform language recognition, whether it was English or German or something. Uh, this is probably uh, the holy grail, as the speech recognition, and that will be the topic of my uh, talk uh, today. And we can also try some higher levels like uh, time relation analysis, uh, who spoke uh, much, uh, who spoke little, and so on. So as I said, I'm going to concentrate uh, on, uh, on speech recognition or ASR. And I think actually this is machine learning meetups. So just for the relation of what we are doing with machine learning, I think everything I'm going to speak about is pretty much applied machine learning. So uh, you might ask why we are doing uh, all this, it's not just for writing papers, uh, but to help uh, some real applications. I am not hiding that our primary customers are guys from military, from intelligence and from security, so basically uh, anytime there is lots of, uh, uh, lots of uh, intercepts, uh, lots of voice, we help these guys find uh, quickly the content or the person uh, they are going after. There is lots of applications also in uh, commercial world. So you know, Czech Republic is the superpower of contact centers. I think it's like more than 30,000 people employed in this country, just in this country, uh, in contact centers. And the contact centers generate really lots of voice data. So uh, we are trying to do something to analyze this data, to organize it to recognize the content, uh, maybe something more. And the third uh, thing we are addressing is the education. So uh, if you go to superlectures.com, you will see our beautiful system that is uh, performing recognition, indexing and visualization of different lectures. And if you are a conference organizer, you can basically uh, send uh, uh, an email to superlectures and the guys will be happy to do uh, commercially all the processing for you. So, uh, who is doing all this? It's the Speech at Fit group, about uh, 20 people of different genders and different races, and I'm, I'm actually very happy that it's uh, not like the usual Czech team, like just guys, just white, uh, just male, but we have also girls and we have some guys from uh, uh, more distant countries. And, uh, well, we are celebrating our 20s anniversary this year because we have started very in very humble circumstances back in 97. Uh, just where we are, Brno Kralovo Pole, this is the FIT campus, so uh, even if you are not interested in speech, but just in architecture, it's probably a good place to visit because there is a Carthusian monastery from the 13th century combined with some modern buildings, so we are very happy about the place uh, we are working at. Okay, that was uh, for the intro. Now, if you want to recognize uh, speech, what components uh, do, you, uh, do you need? Basically, this is the whole scheme. 
the speech is coming from the left and there is text that is coming uh, uh, from the right. And uh, I will walk you from some of the models that we are using. If you are doing some machine learning, basically it's again some applied classical scheme of machine learning where you have something that is entering the system, then there is feature extraction, some evaluation of some numbers, probably these likelihoods, scores, whatever you call it. Then there is some decoding that might be very easy, just selection out of two numbers or very complicated as, as, as for us. And then uh, there's the output. So we are pretty much in this framework, just uh, it's a little bit more complicated because we are dealing with, uh, with speech. So feature extraction means that uh, I have the audio coming and I need some vectors of numbers that I will further process. And that's for it for the moment because I have some more material uh, about feature extraction uh, further on. Then we have acoustic models. And uh, these acoustic models actually map pieces of the audio to some basic sounds. So most often these basic sounds are some words or some phonemes or something like that. And this is the first thing that we will see uh, is trained in the system. So ideally, if we want to train an acoustic model, we would love to have uh, such a beautiful waveform with some uh, uh, phoneme markers like mining uh, of speech and we would exactly know where is which phoneme. Well, we rarely have this because it's very, uh, very hard to, to create. What we mostly have is uh, just some piece of audio. And I so this is a real example of a database. I think it's taken from SpeechDat, a very standard database that we are turning on. And you see that we have the, the audio, we have the transcription, but we do not have exact mapping on uh, which part of the transcription belongs to which part of the audio. So we let the machine learning decide uh, what comes where. Well, another uh, component we need is the language model. So basically, this is no more working uh, on the audio, but on words. And actually, it serves us to answer questions, what is the probabilities of different sequences of words? So if you, can, if you take President George Bush and President George Bush, well, Bush and Bush might be two uh, possibilities from the acoustic model. You see that uh, well, this probability should be higher, right? This should be correct. Now, uh, we also need to train this, and we need to train this on, uh, on huge quantities of text, and this text needs to match the domain. So, if you want to uh, make a check recognizer, the first idea would be to have uh, to take some archive of newspapers, of Mada Fronta Ness, or whatever. The problem is that uh, when we want to go after spontaneous speech, that is normally spoken by the clients in a call center or by the criminals in some uh, police uh, wiretaps, it rarely corresponds to anything that is written. So uh, we would ideally take lots of transcribed speech, but it doesn't exist. So for language models, well, we try to look for some intermediate solutions and sometimes we take just the discussion for, and some of them are so stupid and actually so vulgar that it very well corresponds to what you might uh, hear uh, in, uh, in the normal uh, conversations. Okay, so the next block is the pronunciation dictionary. And this is uh, just giving the transcription of the words into these basic units. So for us, it's, it's, it's the phonemes. And you can either have this pronunciation dictionary written down, so there is maybe some uh, linguist that sits down and uh, crafts you some rules for how the pronunciation is, is done. Or we can train a statistical G2P, that's uh, how we are calling a graphene to phoneme. You take some words with the pronunciations, you just train a statistical model, and then uh, we will get uh, the transcriptions for, for the phonetic forms of unknown words. Uh, another part, putting these three things together, 
is the recognition network. So it's not something that will be trained, but it's just compiled from these uh, three uh, resources. I'm not going to speak too much uh, about this. Just uh, for those of you that are studying some IT faculty and you feel that these guys, like at our faculties, Professor Meduna, Professor Češka, Professor Vojnar, are torturing you with these stupid operations on the graphs and automata, like minimization, determinization, this stuff that never will serve to anyone, you know, so, so this, is the, this is the torture. Well, this is just to remind you that it might serve to something because actually with these operations and with these tools we are preparing recognition networks for our uh, recognizers. So uh, that was the basic, let's say, tour of the recognition system. And what I will be mainly talking about will be these acoustic models and feature extraction. So let's have a look at uh, an ASR system uh, 15 years back. We need some features, like parameters that are describing speech signal. So this is the speech signal. And one thing you can immediately observe is that uh, it's not the same all the time. Well, mathematicians, mathematicians or statisticians would say uh, it's not stationary. It's good that it is not stationary because if it was stationary, it would be very boring. I would be doing like, ah, uh, the whole evening, or sss, and that would be it. So basically our human communication is relying on the fact that this thing is not stationary, uh, but for the guys that are doing machine learning, you know, it complicates our life because uh, we are not able to describe it just with one set of numbers. We need many sets of numbers. So the first thing we do usually is that we divide the signal into segments that we call frames and we extract some parameters from each uh, frame. Now, uh, to have the parameters somehow correspond uh, to how we people process sound, so this is our ear and inner ear, we basically try to simulate it uh, with some uh, signal processing and uh, most of the time we would take some frequency transform like the DFT, discrete Fourier transform, and then we would craft some filter bank that is uh, emulating how we people are hearing. Basically for low frequencies we have very good uh, selectivity, for higher frequencies we don't hear all that well, so uh, that's, that's basically emulated by these uh, MEL filters. And then we might do a couple of other transforms and we have the features that are entering our uh, recognition system. Now, uh, we need to take into account the fact that uh, for a speech unit we have more of these feature vectors. So if I say R, R can be just a quarter a second, but it can be also the whole second if I do R and it's still a meaningful R. So uh, we need some machinery to represent variable uh, length uh, sequences of vectors and that's what we are doing with HMMs, with, with hidden uh, Markov models. Now this is a simple one that is for example representing this R and if we want to represent something more elaborate, so for example 1 and 2, we actually take the Markov models that are uh, representing individual sounds and we concatenate them into, uh, into series. So now uh, we need a mechanism to somehow score the feature vectors in these HMM states. If I say R and this model is trained for R, I need some big value. If I say S and this model is trained for R, I need smaller value. I just need them to recognize the, the basic sounds I'm doing. So these uh, 15 years back, the uh, technique that was used were the Gaussian models. Actually, uh, this is how two Gaussian models look in a two-dimensional space. So you can imagine a point on this plane and you see how high it is on the, uh, on the blue curve, how high it is on the, on the red curve. Probably the blue one is winning, might represent the R, so you say, okay, well, this vector probably was, was R. 
So this is Gaussian mixtures for 2D. If we go to 3D, you can imagine them as some clouds or some 3D objects. The problem is that usually in speech processing we use 39 dimensional vectors and I'm not able to show you 39 dimensional space. So maybe Albert Einstein would be able to do this. I'm Monza, not able to do this. So that was the situation 15 years back. Basically, some uh, engineering crafted coefficients like MFCCs, hidden Markov models, and in each state of hidden Markov model, we have a, a Gaussian mixture model corresponding to something like that, that is uh, receiving the, the feature vectors and producing some scores. Now, uh, well, this changed quite significant, significantly in the last, let's say, 10 years with the neural nets. So I don't know if you are working maybe in other areas of uh, machine learning and you are about the same age as I, well, not, not so many of you, you are young guys. Uh, you might have used some other models, some other techniques, and now actually everything is DNN, everything is LSTM. So it's like a tiger that is eating everything, and the tiger has an NN label on it. Uh, so the first use, now I will walk you a little bit through the history of neural nets uh, in, uh, in speech recognition. Actually the first use of uh, neural nets was uh, in, uh, in feature extraction. So uh, that was around the year 2002 when uh, actually pe many people and uh, there was also the guys from my group came up with the so-called uh, posterior features. And uh, the basic claim here was that if you want to uh, recognize or classify something and you have feature extractor that is producing the posteriors of, uh, of the events that you want to recognize, then actually the recognition system would have e extremely easy job. So imagine uh, uh, features that are just two numbers and number one is going to be high if the guy is a male and uh, number two would be high if the person is, is female and then you want to make a classifier classifying males and females you just need to look at the features and say okay if first one is higher then it's a guy if the second is higher it's a girl so very easy job and that was the basic paradigm of why uh, we uh, came up with these posterior features uh, the second one was that uh, there is something that is called uh, inertia and there is something like context and you know that if uh, someone uh, is uh, saying bata I even don't have to pronounce the last t and you know it would be bata right that was a pretty stupid example so uh, innovation ha b right I don't have to say it so basically we are not looking at isolated uh, feature vectors from some 10 milliseconds, but we are taking into account a uh, broader context. So the thing that was quite important was uh, to take a uh, broader context up to 300 milliseconds, like a third of a second, and then do some classification with neural nets, and then I produce uh, class uh, probabilities. And these class probabilities were then used with, uh, with speech recognizer. Uh, then came this. And actually uh, we call it bottleneck uh, features. The thing is that uh, we again have long context that worked uh, pretty well. We have an neural net. And we train this neural net to recognize again phonemes or some, some acoustic units, but then we say, well, you know, this is probably not the best thing for the recognition system because uh, it might need uh, to have some other information, but we want to provide it some condensed information. So we uh, create one of the layers of the, of the neural net that is thin, that has, for example, just 80 neurons, and we take uh, the outputs of these neurons and maybe with some post-processing we push it further to the recognition system and this is called BN or bottleneck features. And uh, actually uh, back in 2007 people didn't trust uh, neural nets in speech recognition all that much 
And that was quite a victory because uh, at that time the bottleneck features first uh, worked better than the standard uh, MFCCs. So that was quite quite some achievement. And then, well, we worked a little bit more on these bottleneck features and came up with this uh, SBN or stacked uh, bottleneck uh, architecture. At the beginning, again, context of speech. And then there is a sequence of two neural nets, each one with a thin bottleneck layer. And actually the, the thing is that uh, this second stage uh, uh, neural network sees again quite broad context, like around uh, 300 milliseconds. And it's quite a complicated structure, but here in Brain we probably also have some complicated structures, like doing basic acoustic processing first and then inferring some, uh, some higher levels. So it might correspond to how we uh, perceive uh, speech. And actually these stack button-like features really work. They work very nice. So uh, for us and uh, for many others, this is still like production features that are used in, in systems. Uh, when we played uh, with uh, some different inputs, so in addition to spectrogram, we also took some features that are uh, representing the fundamental frequency. Uh, it was working rather well. You know, fundamental frequency is helpful for Asian languages because, well, I took a, a week course of Mandarin last uh, last uh, holidays. And it's like very important if you say "han," "how," or you, you say it with a different melody. It can change the meaning. And uh, these features actually do also very nicely in multilingual training that I will present uh, shortly. The bad thing is that, uh, of course, we like them because well, we worked on them for many years. But they started to lose ground about two years back with the advent of uh, LSTMs, and I will speak about uh, this uh, in a minute. Okay, so that was feature extraction. Now let's have a look at uh, neural nets in uh, acoustic modeling. So just to refresh you with the scheme, we are somewhere here. We have the acoustic models that uh, should transform the speech feature vectors into some uh, into scores of some acoustic uh, units. And uh, actually, you might ask, how come uh, neural nets haven't been used earlier in, uh, in speech recognition? So back in 2005, like this is 10 years or something more, the neural nets were still not so well performing and actually the classical GMM systems were, were, still, were still better. So now, in retrospective, we can say why it was that. Basically, uh, GMMs, it's a very simple paradigm, but there was lots of tricks uh, for different speaker and environment adaptation. So we could adapt these models for, uh, for speakers. Also, it was very easy to GMM to train uh, the, the Gaussian mixtures, uh, mixture models in, uh, in parallel. So it, there is a very easy parallelization on, on data, we just do some batches of processing on different machines and then there are some accumulators that you just sum up and it works very nicely. While at that time it was quite uh, hard to uh, train uh, neural nets. The thing is that uh, back in 2005 GPUs were still used for graphical, for what the, what the abbreviation says, right? This is like graphical uh, process, processing unit. So the guys were doing some gaming with them, and not computation. And uh, there was also some reluctance, purely, uh, purely psychological against neural nets. People just didn't like them. So around that time, we had this beautiful neural net uh, feature extraction, but we had a classical uh, GMM system behind that was called Tandem architecture, and didn't work very nice. And sometimes these systems were really complex, so actually we had two GMM systems that were somehow mutually reinforcing each other and it was quite a hell and uh, this is still a, a, a simple scheme. I remember sitting once in, in Martyrs Karafia 
having A3 paper and having it full of different building blocks. And you just spent quite some time to explain what, what each of them was doing. Okay, so then now we are around uh, 2010 and DNNs take uh, the ground. So there is feature extraction, there is a big DNN with many layers, you know, that's why it is deep. And it is feeding directly the uh, HMM state. So there is no Gaussian mixture model uh, anymore. Well, again, why not before? Why only uh, around uh, 2010? That's basically the years when the DNN uh, development really took momentum and people were adding more layers and devising better pre training and training. Uh, there were lots of other people that were working on computer vision and other machine learning domains. Uh, massive computing power available, so the scientists took over the uh, gamers in the usage of GPUs. And actually, uh, GMMs still have some advantages. It's more, it's easier to adapt them than to adapt uh, DNNs. But sometimes the DNNs simply work so well that we don't care. We don't do any adaptation at all. If you want to do some reading about it, there is a very nice paper from 2012, Hinton et al., uh, from in the Signal Processing magazine. Uh, the funny thing was that the DNNs uh, were still working quite fine with uh, stacked bottleneck features. So we were expecting that once we have this deep, narrow net, we could just pour any features into it and it would uh, work great. So sure, we tried out with MFCCs, with just the filter bank outputs, and uh, it was not that good. It actually worked and still works uh, quite uh, quite well with uh, with uh, SBNs, with these stacked uh, bottlenecks. So why that? Well, we might just speculate that uh, it's because we are trying to emulate this hierarchical structure approaching the signal processing to human brain. But maybe more plausible answer is that we just uh, have this long temporal context, you know, taking these 300 milliseconds, somehow processing it, somehow making it uh, compact and feeding to, uh, to neural nets. Then came uh, other architectures. Well, the recurrent uh, neural nets that uh, include the, the, the feedbacks. So uh, people have known them uh, from, from the 60s, but only around 2010, basically, guys. And I'm very happy that Tom Mikolov from our department was, uh, was uh, among them, came up uh, with working solutions. First, uh, for language modeling, just representing uh, sequences of words by, uh, by this RNN. And then came other people and took it uh, for, for acoustic modeling. Then, of course, the, the situation evolved further. So, uh, simple RNNs uh, were developed into LSTMs. So, you have the whole structure of different uh, gates that are regulating basically the time. So, the LSTM is uh, supposed to uh, remember better the, the important things even from the uh, very distant past. And that was the defeat for the SBN features, because uh, actually when we did some experiments, these DNNs and BLSTM and LSTM work uh, with the... Uh, oh, I should actually shift it. This is just DNN working with these very elaborate uh, stacked bottleneck features, very complicated uh, architecture. And then we took uh, just this, just the filter bank energies that are very, at the very beginning of the SBM processing. So this is maybe like two or three lines in MATLAB. And we use these as the features. And basically with the, the new architectures, with the BLSTM, we got uh, the best results. So, again, why that? Uh, the thing is that LSTMs already work and work very well with the contextual or with the temporal information. And the second thing is that uh, in the SBN architecture, 
we just try to tell the system how it should work with the context. You know, here you have one net, then you do this subsampling, then you have another one, and probably the system just wants to uh, learn uh, this knowledge itself, and that's what uh, LSTM is doing. Of course, that's bringing quite a, quite a nice achievement for us because we have a simple system that is working very well, it's outperforming everything that we had uh, before. It's also making some people sad, so Franta Grasso is very uh, sad about it because well, he was the father of SBMs and now he's looking for uh, what to do next. But that's life. So, uh, to conclude this part, uh, if you want a state-of-the-art uh, SR system, take lots of data, download some uh, speech processing toolkit, for example, Caldi, with maybe the uh, CMTK uh, the library from, from Microsoft, uh, buy a powerful GPU or multi-GPU machine, but nowadays the prices are such that you can really have such a machine at home. Maybe you can switch off the eating in your house if it is running, but it's doable. Use very simple features, just filter bank outputs, define a big LSTM and then put it on and train for a couple of weeks and you will have a very reasonable uh, system. So now I'm coming to some hot topics uh, that we are working on. Uh, let's take first the classical thing, the dictation. So, prepared speech, cooperative user, calm environment. You can buy it, you can buy it in English, you can buy it from our colleagues in Liberec in, in Czech, that's on the market. What do you think is the word error rate for such systems? Which is the percentage of, error, of words that the system puts uh, incorrectly? 40, no. Four, yeah, yeah. So that's about like less than five percent. That's what the vendors say. And I think if if, if you speak nicely and you adapt the system, that's uh, that's quite uh, quite reasonable. Then you have the spontaneous speech coming from uh, let's say reasonable yeah. languages. Then they have one week to return their keyword results. And you, you might ask, well, why one week? But there are a lot of research evaluation methods that people are trying out with keyword search, so it is important to leave a sufficient amount of time there as well. So there was a lecture by a good speaker. What do you think is the error rate here? Yeah, about, about 20. It must be from the domain. And uh, then you have something like that. That was what we had to so that's very nice language, that's Zulu, actually. And uh, we are very happy if we get uh, to 50% of murder rate, if, if we are lucky. And uh, of course it's quite hard. So uh, well, when working nowadays in, uh, in speech recognition, you might have some problems. Actually, there was the whole uh, US uh, government IARPA project that was pouring new languages on us, like six to seven each year. Uh, some of them you have no idea that they even exist, so you have to look up Wikipedia where the guys are speaking it. No idea how to write it. No linguist phonetician, not only around, but probably there is just zero. And uh, you don't have much data, and you are not sure about how good, how well it's transcribed, and it might be not transcribed at all. So I'm not going to talk about all the problems here, just to uh, concentrate on, on these two. And this is leading me to uh, what is hot. So the first hot thing for us is multilingualism. If we have languages with lots of resources, so uh, try to compare it to humans. If you already speak Czech, you speak uh, English, you might speak Russian, you might speak German, then someone comes to you uh, and learn to speak Dutch. You say, okay, Dutch, that's a little bit like English and German, I have to mix it, I, I need to do something with my vocal tract, and uh, that's it, I know, I know Dutch. So basically, if you have learned the know-how, it's easier to uh, learn uh, new languages. Is there any Dutch speaker here? Okay, that's good. 
There is a terrible joke about Dutch that it's not a language, it's a def default of, uh, of vocal track. Uh, so, uh, then basically, technologically, you have a very good ASR system print on uh, these or one of these languages. And then you have a language with low resources. And then you would like to reuse this knowledge in a way that it helps you to do at least somehow working some reasonable uh, ASR. So we have investigated into many ways uh, on how to, how to do uh, such a multilingual training. Uh, actually the one that uh, works and worked is uh, based on uh, an architecture with some split output, output layer. The trick is that uh, we actually first tr uh, train the parts of this output layer for individual languages. So there is some tweaking that you need to do for the training uh, criterion. And then when there is a new language that comes, you just define a new block here. You reuse all the pre-trained rest of the network. You would train for this new block here. And then just gently you retrain the whole net. And this thing is actually working. We have seen that it is working very nicely for the uh, feature extraction. And it also works for uh, the new acoustic models for the uh, LSTMs. So you should know that actually also LSTM has an output layer that we can split uh, into segments. So if we have a look at the uh, results here, we consistently get something better with these multilingually trained things. It's not much better, but just to remember that for these crazy languages we are really fighting each half a percent uh, and everything we can, we can get is basically uh, very nice. So that was the multilingual training and we are still actively working in it. Then is the semi-supervised training. The thing is that uh, you have some transcribed data and then there is much more not transcribed data, just audio for which you have no, uh, no text. So the trick is to train a seed system on the untranscribed data, which will be probably quite stupid because there is not much. Recognize the whole thing with this seed system. Then you need to determine what is good and select some data for training. We retrain on the whole thing and just to be safe, we retune a little bit on the transcribed data not to get it completely screwed up. Now tell me uh, what do you think is the hardest part here? Oh yes, of course, of course, yeah. So actually this is tricky part because you don't have any transcriptions here and you, you should say what is good and what is wrong. This is very, uh, this is very tricky. So again, there was quite some work, and Karel Vesely has the whole uh, PhD thesis uh, about it. Actually, it seems that uh, to be able to guess what is good, what is not good, we need to uh, generate not just one best result, but the whole recognition graphs that we call uh, lattices, then estimate some pervert confidences out of these lattices. These actually seem to match quite, quite well to uh, whether the words are really correct or not. And then there is Carl's magic, so uh, actually quite a simple trick on how to determine the right amount of data to train on. And it seems to be really correlating very nicely with the word accuracy. So for example, if uh, we have a held out part of this data, just a little piece, that we can, uh, that we can, uh, that we can uh, test on, and we, uh, we learn that uh, there is 60% accuracy in this data, then we just take 60% of the best non-transcribed data and it's the optimum. So Karel verified this on a couple of data sets and uh, that's why we call it Karel's magic. I would be happy if you guys can maybe try it out on some different tasks just to verify whether this holds. Uh, another topic that we are on is uh, getting things simpler than these BLSTMs, because they are really complicated, they have these recurrent uh, connections. So uh, we were going after some architecture that would be simpler and still uh, powerful, 
and that's how Kartik Bhaskar came up with this residual memory networks that are actually complex. It's not as easy as a simple DNN, but there is no single uh, recurrent uh, uh, link. And actually, again, after some experimenting, it seems that they are as uh, good as LSTMs with simpler architecture and, uh, and faster uh, training. So that were, that were the three, let's say, hot things that seem quite promising and that, uh, that we are on. And there are even hotter topics. So uh, the first is what I call SR from wire. Uh, we have done a little bit on it, but it's mainly done by, by Google and uh, Aachen people. And actually the thing is that uh, here is the waveform. There is a sequence of neural nets, and at the end we have the words. And basically first you initialize the nets uh, in order to emulate some signal processing uh, operations, like for example filtering or, uh, or Fourier transform here. But then you really let the whole thing train, and you hope that uh, it would be better than the classical thing with handcrafted uh, spectral analysis or filtering. Actually, these guys claim that it is better, but they need really lots of data uh, on it, and it's like still under heavy investigation. Another thing is that uh, I call ASR from raw data, or sometimes I call it ASR from nothing, but Lukas Borget, who is the author of, of this, doesn't like me for this. So ASR from raw data. Imagine that uh, we have audio data, lots of. You just uh, record all the TV or you go with, with the microphone to the street. And then you have unrelated text data, lots of. But you have no link in between the two, as we have normally when training on uh, transcribed data. And you want to have a speech recognizer uh, out of here. So there was a whole uh, Johns Hopkins University workshop uh, last year on this where the guys have shown that this is indeed possible, but this is really, for the moment, basic research and it needs to be pushed and to, to show whether there is uh, some practical application. And uh, the last one I have here is a sentiment analysis, but you can imagine, actually, well, the guys from Connexia are smiling because this is, this, this, this is from uh, their, uh, their project. And uh, there is uh, lots of uh, higher level, let's say, semantic uh, uh, processing. And just to show you that uh, th these are some Twitter messages. So the training set uh, was uh, labeled with like either positive or negative. And then there was an error that uh, trained in, in order to uh, estimate uh, the, the sentiment out of the messages. And you see that uh, it quite makes sense. Of course, that looks very nice, so all the business people are very eager, they say, okay, this is perfect, I have my contact center recognizer, so I'm going to plug it in and I will sell it to my customers and they will make all their clients happy. The little thing is that this is heavily language dependent, so you can train it very nicely for English, but if you just want to port it to any other language, uh, you need the labels. If you don't have the labels, you have a problem. So, that's pretty much it. The conclusion is that uh, well, there is not yet really time for retirement for us. Still lots of stuff to do in speech. And this is concluding my talk. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay, I'll take any questions. Yes. Do you have any questions? Now we have a discussion part, so you can ask. Yeah, thanks for the talk. I'm sorry if this is slightly off topic, but one of my friends told me that uh, nowadays there, there are some models or some companies that are able from, let's say, 20 minutes of speech, of random speech from one person, they are able to reconstruct any given text, like that it was said by this person, even though it wasn't. So there isn't really a question, but do you have any comments on that? Or? Reconstruct text means that uh, actually uh, there would be like text-to-speech synthesis, like uh, yeah. as, as if the person said the text. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, 
it's probably not going to be perfect quality, but it will work. So, so there are some techniques for adapted or speaker adapted uh, speech synthesis. Well, that was also not imaginable a couple, couple of years back, but now the people, similar things that, uh, that, that are done for recognition with, uh, like, with, with neural nets and adaptation are done also in synthesis. So I think it's doable. It will not be perfect, and maybe if you put there some uh, complicated word that would be difficult also for the person, or it is rare in the language, you will recognize that it's not the person, it's, it's, it's a system. But uh, let's say for some standard vocabulary, standard phrases, it might work pretty well. Yeah, like, so, so a person won't be able to recognize whether it's uh, what? I cannot comment on this, actually. I would have to listen to some to some of these. I actually came up across some popular article where they were reconstructed, reconst uh, well, making Obama voice and Trump voice and Clinton's voice reading some text. It was still recognizable, but uh, well, the technology is advancing fast, so it might not be in a couple of years. Thanks, Todd. Uh, hi, yeah, sorry, just in, in reference to that last question, actually, uh, I'm from Startup Yard, one of our startups last year, Neuron Soundware, uh, demonstrated a system that could reproduce a voice uh, without reference to, to the source material, but only words that had already been recorded, uh, so the system could learn from the actual speech. Uh, so in that case, uh, I've seen that done, but I haven't seen it uh, applied to new words. My question actually was about, um, it seems that you're mostly interested in uh, in language processing from from perspective of big data. What about uh, language acquisition theory? Uh, does that have any effect on the way that uh, that people are are uh, building systems to understand how language is acquired uh, in the way a human mind works? Frankly, we are not too much into, in, into this, so we are following rather this like standard engineering and machine learning paradigms. But there are people that, uh, that are into it. So there is, for example, uh, Emmanuel Dupont, uh, the French guy, one of the French universities. If I, if I think for a moment, I will tell you which one. But uh, he, he, he's working a lot into the child, children language acquisition and, uh, and trying to project this. On, uh, on how the technology works, and it seems that he has some successes, but th this is like, again, one of the areas of basic research, I, uh, I would say, I haven't seen any like major industrial application, but maybe there will be something out of it. So this doesn't have an effect on the way that you think about, uh, uh, about your work yet? Uh, no, not really. We are, we are still quite busy with our little engineering problems here. Is it an issue of lack of data in that in that space? Because we don't have a lot of data on the way the, the brain works, or just that it, it's not uh, it's not as attractive. I think it's not probably as attractive because uh, because people can still do lots of advances with just pushing the machine learning like you know, theory and, and implementation further and the way uh, we have advanced like from the Gaussian mixture models like 15 years back to, to, to nowadays results is like really tremendous. So I, I think it's still not, not at the end. So I must say uh, the, the mainstream is not so much interested uh, in this like there are these guys like Emmanuel Dupont, but uh, I would say the the mainstream is not taking that so seriously at the moment. And whether it is good or not, I, I don't know. Maybe actually uh, in 10 years everyone will train LSTMs the, the, the way children do. I don't know. Everybody talks about deep neural networks nowadays. Uh, what makes them so different and so successful? Are there any other things apart from the fact that they have multiple layers, more than classic neural networks? That's exactly as, as, as you said. That's basically just a sexy term. Uh, well, you know, people needed this, this sticker. It's not neural net. I have bought this new Tesla machine or whatever, so I need to put a new sticker to it, so it will be a deep neural net. It's, it's basically still the same as the, as the ordinary neuron. So it's 
normal modular concept. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The people are playing with uh, with some uh, pre-training uh, techniques, like some restricted Boltzmann machines, whatever at the beginning. But now I think most of them are just trained with, with just the very simple back propagation as, as the usual neural nets that were known 30 years back. Just we have bigger machines. So you've talked about the recurrent nets. Uh, what about convolutional nets? Uh, are they used for uh, sound or are they, do they work? That's basically more the domain of, uh, of uh, computer vision guys. So these guys are using them all the time. In speech, uh, there are some people that try to play with them in this, uh, in what I call the, the recognition from wire. So here, I, I think the, the very first, this, this little blue block, uh, are some CNNs because they, well, they are more suited for this. Uh, generally, I, for speed guys, they are not so, so interesting, but they might become interesting if, if, if we find out that these like Aachen and Google guys are right and that we should recognize from wire. Frankly, I don't know. I would say that it's a good for detecting the phonemes, for example, because the convolutional window can detect like local features or something. Uh, I don't know. Okay, the, the thing is that the phonemes are, the, are of variable length. So then you would have some ways on how to stretch the, this net or contract it. And uh, it sounds interesting, but for the moment people are really just using these uh, LSTMs combined with HMMs and that works very nicely. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I have also one question. You uh, mainly spoke about uh, speech processing. Do you process any other sounds, like, for example, analyze sounds of broken things in the research group, or is it mainly about speech? Uh, the, well, we are trying to concentrate, so we, we are the really speech guys. We, we even don't do the, the, the synthesis, we are just on speech data mining and that's occupying us quite, quite a lot. But there are people that are doing like this non-destructive analysis by sound and, and, and you have it in factories, you have it on the helicopter rotors and, and uh, whatever, and it's actually working. It's very nice, we are just not doing it. Maybe mention it, but I uh, didn't pro probably miss it. Uh, do you apply Fourier transform to the input before you pass it to the neural nets, or you pass it as uh, uh, the signal you obtain from the input device? Actually, we, we, we do. We do apply Fourier transform, so we, so we get the standard uh, Fourier spectrum, and then we run it uh, through some filters that uh, emulate the human hearing. So actually we just weight them by some triangles that are getting wider and wider towards uh, higher frequencies and that's w what we call either metal filter bank or bark uh, filter bank. So yes, we do. But there are people that, uh, that are saying that the Fourier transform is not necessary and that they will do everything with neural nets. So far, I would say there is no clear, no clear winner. If you have a look at at uh, the papers of this girl, of Tara Sainat. Actually, she claims that, of course, this is the, the best, but so far we didn't see any advantage over having the frequency transform at the beginning. Are there any other questions? So, in case there are none, thank you very much again. Thank you.